Hi, so I'm Lizzie Linhardt. I teach at a university in Austria on web development, but I mostly do front-end development. But I want to talk to you about today about mobile web animation and about the mobile way of animating on the web. What we see in the, in the mobile world is that the mobile market is really growing. So there's a really great report on, on how mobile <coughs> subscriptions are evolving. And there's a really big growth, especially in the Middle East and in Africa. So a four times growth between 2015 and 2021. So we see that especially in developing countries, we get more and more mobile subscriptions, more people get online on their mobile phones. Mostly their only access to internet is on their mobile phones. And there's a really great paper by Will Mahler that's called Mobile Phones and Inequality that explored how mobile phone access um, contributes to the fortunes of disadvantaged population. So how population that only has access to the internet is influenced by this mobile access. So like I already mentioned, a lot of people only can get on the internet on their mobile phones. And he found out that they mainly use the, their mobile phones as tool to take advantage of digital res resources, to learn, to strengthen and grow their personal networks and to enhance coordination and mobi mobility in everyday life. So to, to, get, to get more connected, to get out of, of the closed circles and to work on a more global scale. But he, what he also mentioned is that there is a big gap between those who can access the internet only on their phone and those who can also access this or access it on other devices, like a desktop computer or a tablet. So we have this device divide. So those marginalized by race, income and education are more likely to, to depend this on the smartphone internet access. And so the experiences they have on those smartphones are a lot more influenced by how we program those applications. So disadvantages Disadvantaged groups are really influenced by how much storage they have on their phone, how strong the processing power of the phone is, and whether they are offline or online. So how the application deals with poor network connection, outages, and all those kinds of things. But my specialty is more animation, so I wanted to find out <coughs> how the differences are between native applications and PVAs or mobile websites in terms of in terms of user experience. On the left you can see Headspace, the mobile website or the PVA, and on the right you can see the native application. And what you see there is that the native application has a lot of animations, it feels very smooth, it has a lot of animated transitions, while the left Mobile website, the PVA, is very a lot more chunky with hard cuts and it's just not as, as smooth and you get dis disoriented a lot more. And then we also have this, this push towards PVAs. So a lot of web developers, they push towards progressive web apps and to say that not all, not all apps need to be standalone because we have a lot of device features we can already use with the web APIs like Bluetooth, USB, geolocation, and a lot more. If you program a PVA, you don't need an Apple Play Store. So you often have a higher conversion because the users don't need to install your app. They can directly access it in the browser. And they're often smaller in size because they don't need to be built for Android or iOS in the, in the whole thing. So then <coughs> I decided to write my master thesis on this UX aspect, the difference between native and PVA in animation. And when I did that, I also found out that touch is really important. So how touch interaction and animation work together in mobile web interfaces. I read lots of papers on animation. There's a lot of papers on animation and touch and how all that works and what to do and what not to do. And I found that Animation in the, mobile, in the mobile web is really closely connect, connected to touch interaction 
and then also to a lot of mobile concerns like small screen sizes, where you're using the application, how usable the application is, how big touch targets are, and all those kinds of things. I coded a little progressive web app, and then <coughs> I tested it against the exact same app that was not animated. So the left one is static, the right one is animated, and you can also look at those at your phones over the bit.ly link. So I tested those to see what the differences are in the in the usage of of the animations and if the animations were useful to the to the users. And we will see what the what the influence of that was in the end. But first I want to talk about what the problems are with the mobile web. What are the problems in interaction in animation <coughs> when we look at mobile websites? One is the missing touch interaction. So often applications aren't reactive to touch. So in this example, we have this menu that slides in from the left. And then the natural thing would be to be able to slide it away with a slight gesture. But on a lot of mobile websites, mobile web websites, we're still missing that. So that would be a better example. That's a, the WeGo PVA. And that uses the app shell model, which already gives that kind gives that to you kind of out of the box. And there you can use the slight gestures to remove the menu again in a natural way. Another problem is loss of orientation. So whenever we interact with, with an interface, we have lots of different screens. And if we don't have animations, but we have lots of different screens, if they just have hard cuts between them, we don't know how how the interface changed and how all the screens are connected to together. So here the problem is that we don't really know why something is changing, how the screens are changing and how all the elements are connected together. So a better way would be to use animated transitions. So this is a native app that uses a lot of animated transitions. And there you can see if a new screen comes in, it comes in from the left, or if a new menu comes in, it comes in from the top or bottom to show that you're moving to another information space and that you're now changing navigation. And that makes it a lot easier to recognize where in the application you might be. And if you're changing to a sibling screen or a parent screen and all those kinds of different navigation changes. And then another one is performance and network connection. So oftentimes, especially, especially in developing countries, we know that they don't have access to data or rarely have access to data because it's really expensive. So oftentimes they will be offline. This is a Norwegian news website I found, which takes around six seconds to load on a mobile network, which is quite long. Um, Financial Times is also a news website that's really optimized on performance. And here you can see you already see some content after two seconds. So if we s see them next to each other, that really makes a difference because we can already kind of know what we can click on and what, what's there in the interface. But if it takes really long to load, the, the experience is really bad. So here, some skeleton screens with some animations can be really useful to kind of give the user an idea of what is loading. And the last part that's often bad is when the user doesn't feel in control. That happens with a lot of hard cuts and weird appearing windows that we're now used to kind of, like cookie disclaimers and all those kind of things. And it's really bad if the user doesn't feel in control and if something is appearing and disappearing with the user wanting it to be there. So an, a native application should always behave in a predictable way and um, do what according to the user input. So here it slides down when you, when you pull it down and it animates when you really click on it and it's not moving content in or out without any user input. So these are some areas that are really important and that are also kind of connected to animation. So touch interaction, 
navigation, moving around in applications, wait times, so whenever someone has to wait to show that there is some activity or some progress happening or to explain something, and control so the user doesn't feel like something is happening without them wanting to do it. Let's look at a few good examples. So this is a native app that does sound, so it creates sounds for you to relax. And they have these really nice onboarding animations that slowly fade in the icon in the, in the top and then the text in the bottom. And we have these animated tr transitions between the different screens and we fade in content gradually whenever we need it. So we take care of wait times and of orientation by having these animated transitions. Then here we have the kitchen app again that has recipes. We have this sliding in animation from the bottom. That's a navigation animation. And we are indicating change in the content by fading in the new pictures whenever we're updating our filters. So that makes it more the user more in control because he can slide in and slide out the elements. We have touch control and we also have navigation animation with with the different screen sliding in depending on which in which part of the application we are. That's Airbnb. So Airbnb has spinners and loaders when content um, is currently loading. They have these nice sliders, so that's also very common in connection with animation to hide something off screen. Um, they fade in the new content whenever you click on another thing and they have also these navigation animations with things sliding in from the bottom. So there we already also have control, touch feedback, um, taking care of loading times. And yes, that's the last one. Fabulous. Has a really nice loader in the beginning. And this is kind of a delightful animation on the top with the sun that's moving around depending how much you've entered in that form. So you're kind of showing your progress with animation, which is also very common. And then they fade in and fade out whenever new content or new buttons appear. And they show only the content that needs to be shown in the moment. And here there's a really nice loading animation that helps the user to not be bored while they're loading the new content. So this is really good in times of wait times and also in orientation. All right. So these are really good examples for how animations are done in native applications. But now the question is, how can we do that also on the web? How can we bring some of those animations to progressive web apps? So I already told you that navigation and the context the user is currently in is really important because we have a lot of screens and we need the user to stay oriented during navigation changes. There was a study um, that's called Transition Animation Support Orientation Mobile Interfaces Without Increased User Effort, so a very long scientific title. And they found out that when animations were present, more participants had the impression of interacting with one continuous space instead of separate screens. So the, the animations helped the users to stay oriented while navigating in their application. So I built a little example that's very common that we've already seen in a few of those native apps. And that's clicking on some button and then having another menu slide in from below. And I want to show you how we can do that on the web. So essentially we have, we have some application and then we have the other screen on the bottom. So we have to position it outside of the screen and then we have to animate the transform. So on the web we animate by, by <coughs> animating two properties, the opacity property and the transform property, because these are the two most performant attributes to animate on the web and other properties like width, top, left, are very unperformant to animate on the web because that are layer properties and changing them causes a lot of recalculations in layout. So we should always stick to this transform property that's there in the transition. And then on the web we can easily 
trigger animations by adding new classes. So here we have this bottom nav class, and in the bottom we add this visible class, and whenever this visible class is present, we just change the transform property. And the animation happens with the transition keyword, so we're transitioning between the two different states. And then that should easily slide in. But that's only half the part, because now we're only having the touch interaction. We're clicking the button and it's sliding in. But now we want this dragging down interaction with touch. And that we can do by adding event listeners. So on the web we can add event listeners on start, on move, on end, on cancel. And then we need to add event listeners for each of those events. So when the first touch event happened, when it's happening, and when the last touch event happened. And then to add this dragging down gesture, we first need to handle the first event. So we need to check if it's the first event. We need to get the first position of that first touch event. And we need to move the, remove this transition we set before that animated it in and out, because we don't want to CSS to interpolate while we change things in JavaScript. Then we need to get the exact position of the, of the touch event. And that's where it gets a little bit more complicated because in a, in a mobile browser we have a lot of, or in the browser in general, we have a lot of events we can listen to. We can les listen to click events, to touch events, to point the events. And so we need to ma make sure we get the right events and the right positions. And then when we're continuously updating, we're checking if it's not the first event, we're getting our X and Y values. If rough panning is the performant way of updating um, animations on the web, so we're using the window request animation frame to update the position of this topper in a performant way. And then the actual update happens inside this window request animation frame. And then in our update function, we're only updating if a frame is available. We're calculating the difference between the first touch position and the last touch position. Then we're calculating what the transform of this element should be. And then we're changing the Y transform of this element. And we can also do that with C CSS variables, which is a fairly new way of doing it. But you could also directly change that in JavaScript. And in the end, we're resetting the request animation frame variable so we can call a new update when a new frame is available. And then in the, in the end of the touch event, we need to reset everything. So we need to reset the transitions. So we want the tr transitions to be there again. We add the transition for the transform. So then when we click the button again, it transitions up again. And one more note on that. When we're animating an element a lot, like a menu, that's a very common use case, we should promote it to a new layer. So in the browsers, we have different layers we can use. It's similar to Photoshop. And when something is on its own layer, it can be moved around more perf performantly. We can do that with the will change property. So we'll change CSS transform. We'll move that menu to a new layer. But we can also do that with other things, like a 3D transform. So using transform translate set or tr transform translate 3D, animated 2D transforms, animated CSS filter, or being on top of a compositing layer also creates new layers. But every layer we create in the browser consumes memory. So if we create lots of layers, we will get worse performance because we're using up a lot of the browser's memory. So we should remove them if the animation is finished and only create them if we, re we really need them and really moving elements around all the time. So this simple animation gives you touch, touch control and general more control to the user. And <coughs> on animated transitions and navigation animation, there's a really good guideline on the material docs to shows the different kinds of transitions we can have in animation. So we can have parent-child transitions that kind of shows that a child is transitioning in. We can have sibling transitions. So <coughs> transitions that are very common in tapas that slide in sibling, sli sibling screens from the side. 
and then we can have top level transitions that when they're playing that kind of fade in and fade out the different elements. Oh no, is it playing? Yes. So these are screens that are not connected in a in a relationship way, but kind of we want to fade in between them. So we have top ne top level navigation. And yeah, this is really useful in understanding which trans transition might be the right one to use. And then another good use case are the wait times. So whenever whenever a user has to wait, that's that's important to take care that the user isn't leaving, isn't bored, doesn't understand what's happening. So very common are loaders. So oftentimes we have those loaders and they're really useful because the user doesn't think he's waiting as long as he is actually waiting. We can also use text to explain why the user needs to wait and we can make the waiting process a lot less frustrating. And these loaders can also really emphasize branding. So show who you are and explain what your brand is doing. That took around 20 seconds. If you look at 20 sec seconds just counting up without text, it's a lot more boring. So these, these loading animations are really, really useful in using the time that is <coughs> available to explain something and make these waiting times less frustrating. And on the web, they're really easy to do. So a spinner like that, that just shows that something is happening. It's just one DOM element that has a class and then one CSS snippet that kind of defines what that circle does. So we have an animation that has a name and then we have the animation at the bottom in CSS that's called scale out. And there we just define the animation. So it scales from zero to one and the opacity <coughs> changes from one to zero. And that's all you need to have this little indication that something is happening and your system is busy. So that's really good for wait times. Another problem we often have is display cl clutter. So since in a mobile application you have a lot, a lot of screens, you often have too much information on the screens and it's hard to find the element or the information you actually need. Here's an example for native application that uses animation to display additional content. So first they only show the headings and when you click on it, you get the content you actually want. Another good use case for that would be tooltips. So animated tooltips that give you the animation whenever you need it and not all the time. There's another interesting paper called Display Clutter, a review, a re review of definitions and measurement techniques. And they define Display Clutter as the decrement of performance and the cost of attention. And the visual, vis visual search decrements that results from the display-based and the user-based factors. So we get a lot slower in searching, in attention and in performance when we have a lot of display clutter. So this is an Austrian newspaper website and it's really, it takes a lot of attention. It has a lot of red, it has a lot of different items and there's not really a lot of white space, so it's hard to focus. If you compare that to the Los Angeles Times, that's a lot more clear, there's more white space, there's less, less clutter and I know where the heading is and where to read and where the menu is and it's not as packed. And <coughs> This is really useful with animation as well because we can reduce menus to a single icon instead of adding all the text. That's very common to just have the menu and then click on that. We can also remove sometimes navigation elements like errors or other things if, we, if the user is really used to the touch gestures. And animation then makes up for the lack of visible navigation tools by showing the relationships between the different screens we have. And that way we can save screen space or by expanding additional content. So this is also not too hard to do on the web. I built a little demo for you that just shows some dogs. 
and when you tap it, you get some additional information on each dog. How we do that on the web is by having one element, and then the hidden, hidden text is, again, similar to the bottom navigation before, hidden to the right. And <coughs> then we need to, uh, again, listen to the touch events. So whatever touch event we want to have, we can also have mouse events or pointer events. And the only thing we need to do when we register a touch event is toggle a CSS class. So we're only tog toggling the class visible that animates in or out the new content. And then in CSS, we transition the transform again because that's the most performant one. And we show the, only the hidden part that's hidden to the right in the, in the content. And now I want to talk a little bit about the timing of animations and also about the, the easing, so the cubic Bezier. So the timing for user interface animations, there's a really good article by Val Head that's called How Fast Should Your anima UI Animation Be? And in general, they should be really fast. So it should be between 0 to 200 milliseconds for a small animation like hovers, fading, little scalings. And then if you have a lot of distance, a lot of movement, or very complex e easings, like a bouncing, you should take longer timings, between 200 and 400 or 500 milliseconds. And these really fast UI timings, they're more likely to attract attention because they're happening very quickly. If you have long, slow transitions, people often don't notice that there is an animation happening because it's transitioning so slowly. So these, that's a little bit about how fast these user interface animations should be. And then we also have the easing. So in CSS, ease in, ease out, or these cubic Bezier easings. There's a website called easings.net. And all these easings you see here, you can do in CSS. So these are really basic easings, like ease in sign or ease in out circ. And you can simply use them in CSS. When you click on them, you get the cubic Bezier for them. And then there's more complex easings, like an elastic easing or a bouncy easing. And these you can only do in JavaScript because CSS can only do simple easings. And now the question is, which, which easing do I need to use? So people often don't know which, which one the right is, and so they always use ease in, ease out. If we use an ease out easing, it starts off quickly and then it gets more slowly. So that feels a lot more reactive. That's good, for example, a link cover or a button animation. And then if we have really complex easings like that, they need, they need longer timings, like I already mentioned, because they need longer time to process that bounce or that elastic movement. When an element is moving into the screen, it should start off quick and that then get slower towards entering. So in the end, it should, the animation should slow down. So a ease out would be the right choice. And when it's leaving the screen, it should start off slow and then get quicker towards the end. So then a ease in would be better. All right. And now the last part I want to talk to you about is touch and animation, because I found that they're really closely together and that they are the parts that make animation really useful in a mobile use case. There was a study on how users hold their phones, and they observed that 50%, almost 50% of the users hold their phone one-handed. So they only navigate in your, in your application with the thumb, or w mostly with the thumb. Then 36% held it cradled, and only 15% held it two-handed. And they also found out that the people who hold their phone one-handed typically hold their phone in a variety of different positions. So the touch areas are really different depending on how they hold their phone and if they're left or right-handed. They then did a follow-up study, and they found out that people can read content best at the center of the screen, and they often scroll, cent scroll content to the center of the screen to be able to read it better. And the touch accuracy also gets better 
in the center of the screen. So the more outside of the center it is, the larger the touch target needs to be because people are less accurate in touching those elements. So in the center they can be a little bit smaller, but outside of the center they need, need to be bigger because the touch accuracy is a lot less good. And then in connection to touch, we have different gestures we can use. And what I found out is that we should really stick to very core, ge core gestures and not use really unknown gestures or complicated gestures because most users aren't used to them. And if we use other gestures, we really need to teach the user how to use this gesture in our in interface. So I'm going to show some examples for the one in the first row. So tap, double tap, drag are still gestures you can use pretty easily, but then if it comes to spreading and pinching, these are harder to use, especially for users that aren't as accustomed to your user interface. So we already saw a sim simple tap animation. We tap something and it shows additional content. That's quite, quite easy to do. Double tap is also not too hard to do. That's useful for um, example, liking an image on, on whatever platform you are on. So adding some additional shortcuts to like something instead of like a tiny heart in the bottom, you can tap the big image. And this <coughs> double tap animation is also done in CSS again. And here we have instead, instead of a transition, we have a animation. And this animation scales up this heart and then it translates it to the right bottom corner. And then again I have a timing since this animation is a little bit more complex, it's a little bit longer. And then I have the cubic bezier to kind of control how the animation, how fast and quickly it ends. And then the registering of the touch event we can do with just a touch end event in the browser, so we're only listening to touch end, and then we're recording when the last tap happened, so we're recording the, the time of the last tap. And if the time of the last tap and the, the current tap are only a few milliseconds apart, we're toggling a CSS class again. So we're just calculating the differences between the different taps and seeing if it was a double tap by measuring the time between the last taps and that already gives you double tap support in your animations. But I want to show you a little bit uh, an example that's a little bit more complicated, so dragging or swiping. And that's a <coughs> demo I built that where you can drag down or drag up cards and then a new card appears. <coughs> And doing dragging or swiping animations and support is a lot more complicated because there's so many different ways of doing touch support and we already saw that the JavaScript examples kind of grew bigger and bigger. So I recommend if you do more complicated gestures other than tap or drag, you use a library like Hammer.js that gives you really good touch support for your different interface elements. And how we use it is that here in the fourth line, we're creating a new hammer element on our, on our card element. And then we set the direction of that hammer element to vertical. So we only want to be able to, to swipe it up and down, not left and right. And then we calculate the difference, so how far it has been swiped. So we get this event delta y from hammer.js that gives us, the di gives us the distance. And then we also rotate the element a little bit, depending on how far we've swiped. So it's rotated more the further we have swiped. And then again, the request animation frame function. So the request animation frame function is what makes it more performant to update. So I actually update on, on updating the, the transform of our element is happening inside the request animation frame. And I want to explain to you why, why that is important. So with animation, we continuously want to update the screen and get as many frames as possible. So 60 frames per second, for example. And when we have a touch move event, 
Here, for example, if we call it inside the request animation frame function, it will update it right before the next frame. If we have it somewhere in the center, it waits until the next frame is happening and updates it then. And that's what makes it more performant. So if we have like three or five or 100 touch events during the current frame, but we're not ready to update our frame, we're only updating with the last touch move event and not 100 other touch move events um, that are where, the, where our frame wasn't ready. So that's why we use this request animation frame function to update our animations. And then inside our update functions, we're updating our, our Y value, so moving it down and our rotation of our element. And we're also re removing the transition because we don't want CSS to transition because we're updating in JavaScript the, the transform and we only want to transition the op opacity but not the transform because we're currently changing that in JavaScript and otherwise it gets janky. And then we listen to whether it has re reached the end, so the distance we want to reach before animating in the new element. So we, we figure out how far, how far it should go and once it reached a certain distance, we stop the animation so that the drag support, animate it out and animate the new element in. And then in, with Hammer.js we can also listen to other events like the end of the drag gesture and the start of a new drag gesture. So in this example when a new element is dragged I'm resetting all the other elements to have them be able to animate again and drag again. All right, that was one example of adding touch support on the web. But now I want to <coughs> go back to the start. So what I found out when I did these two things. So when I created one static and one animated interface. What I found out is that users prefer animated interfaces when they're done in the right way. So, so our interface animation shouldn't delay the delay the user or annoy the user. In my study, a lot of users didn't even notice that they were there and no one found the animations annoying because they're very really subtle and not too long. Combining touch gestures with animation can allow, allow the user to, be, to become accustomed to shortcuts through gestures. So if the users know the gesture they can use, they can become a lot quicker in in navigating around your navigation. So this is very common in iOS. And that's what, we, what what's called expert user in a lot of the papers. So expert users are the users that know all your different shortcuts they can use. And a lot of the animation processing happens subconsciously, which is why often good animation is not noticed by the users. So that happened in my study as well. A lot of the participants didn't notice that there was animation and were surprised when I told them that that was the main difference between the two interfaces. And <coughs> when we make PBAs more similar to native applications, the users feel like it's more like an app than a mobile website. So they they kind of think it's similar to a native application rather than it being a mobile website. That was also interesting that they considered this PVA to be an app. So the most important part when doing PVAs, wanting them to be more usable, is avoid missing touch feedback, avoid small touch targets. So that's one of the most common usability concerns are small touch targets. Avoid gestures that aren't understandable and avoid animations that aren't consistent with the touch movement. So if you have a touch gesture that moves an element, the element should animate the same speed that the user is touching the screen and not another speed, faster or slower. Then in terms of navigation, we should avoid hard cuts between different screens. We should avoid missing transitions when something updates, so not explaining the relationships between the different elements. And yeah, that was the last point. And uh, concerning to wait times, 
We should avoid empty screens, so long waiting times where nothing is happening, six or ten seconds of empty screens, missing loading animations, so loading times are very useful to show some text, to explain something, especially useful in onboarding. We should add some skeleton screens to show what, where content might be appearing, where images are appearing. And we should avoid long, long waiting times or make use of loading animations to make these waiting times seem shorter. And then in terms of control, we should avoid um, not having feedback on touch events, like touching a button or touching some navigation. Blue flashes are also very common in PVAs or mobile websites, so that's when you click a link, you always have these blue flashes, but you never have them in native applications. And we can get rid of them with CSS, but that's something we need to do by hand. We should also avoid long, annoying animations that keep the user from doing something he wants to do. So it shouldn't hinder the user in, in doing something else and not considering touch areas like the center or the bottom. So where a user touches <coughs> needs to be considered. And in the end, there is a really good quote by Heather Deckett that's out of the Animation at Work book. And it says that users should only notice your animation if you need to attract their attention in that moment. Otherwise, micro-interactions and other transitions should be so seamless that users don't even notice that there is an, an animation. So good animation is animation that is often invisible and not noticeable. That was all I had today. I sometimes blog about animation on my website, so you can check that out and you can talk to me on Twitter. Thank you.